you know, um, I don't know how this reset is going for you. You can type in the comments, let me know. But like for me, <laughs> on God, on God, um, whenever a person is going through a transition, I always say that you have to remember that whatever pattern you're trying to come out of, it has its own signature way of manifesting in the world. And whenever you say that you're going to change out of that existing pattern, or break the cycle, or break a curse, or whatever, that thing itself, that same energy, it like it it wants to keep its own rhythm you know it's like a wheel cycling it's like the moon and it's anchoring to the earth everything has its own pattern and it takes a lot to get a thing out of its pattern even when that thing is our own behavior Ooh, especially when that thing is our own behavior there are patterns of behavior that are linked to different seasons of our lives. I know for myself, something that plays out when I'm very anxious is I will doom scroll on like Twitter, you know, it's my preferred social media. And then sometimes you scroll the whole timeline and you actually cannot find anything new you don't see anyone that you're not familiar with or something that you haven't already seen and then i'll just go to another um platform i'll go to like pinterest i remember i saw this pattern in myself and i was like okay cool deactivate i don't think i deactivated but i deleted the twitter app and i said only for work and then I ended up downloading TikTok. <laughs> so it's just there's patterns of behavior that come with each and every season of our lives. And when we're doing work like this, this clearing work, and we're making the kind of setting, the kind of intentions that we set, which is to reset to break certain social contracts that no longer serve us but at the same time we know that these social contracts they exist between ourselves and people that we value in some instances and what the thing is there's this teaching that i have seen in certain healing communities which speaks to cutting people off you know like cutting family off cutting friends off and i just don't prescribe to it as much and that may be vows of loyalty it may be whatever it can be written as but it's also the understanding um, that Singabantu, Ngabantu, we are because of whom we are to in, in a certain instance. And I think that quite often we're seeking to be understood by people outside of us outside of ourselves like by the people who surround us we want to be understood but we don't understand ourselves perhaps what we should be seeking is to be considered in some way which is fair which is understandable but we're often working from a place of wanting the other person to have an understanding of where we're coming from without fully having unpacked for ourselves where it is that we're coming from.
in any social dynamic. And I saw so much of those patterns playing out for me with this move. I was just like, things that I've identified in the past, and I was just, honestly, my mouth was a game, and I was screaming. Like, yesterday, oh please, I hated yesterday. Not only um, did I wake up to a notification that was just like, why? And then the emotions just came up like a river from inside of me. And I mean, I'm just proud of myself for being able to wash and eat yesterday. I'm doing Vlogmas on the Sangoma Society YouTube channel. I didn't post a video yesterday. It's not that I don't, I didn't, I had to make the content fresh or anything like that, but it's a pattern that I've seen in myself. You know, one of the first things that clearing into consciousness ever helped me with was dealing with my second divorce from a marriage that I had had so much joy and growth in and, you know, being a part of a family that I still value and respect and having been so affirmed in that experience but having to choose differently for myself because of where I was in my personal journey and how it was just no longer working uh, for the mutual journey and oh my God, because my identity, like throughout adulthood, literally since the age of 22, has been that of wife. <laughs> Me at the age of 35, I didn't like having to re understand myself really made it very difficult for me to be able to do that other stuff, the output stuff, the YouTube. But doing this work like clearing into consciousness, that was possible. But when I processed through and was able to release and grieve that ending, I still saw that there was so much inconsistency with me still on those most public platforms. And I think it comes from my process is not so much that I know there's some people who come onto these platforms and they gain a sense of self through them and that's, you know, like what keeps them going, that this is where they get their validation. But for me, it's kind of the opposite, like I, I don't know how to perform that, like legitimately turn on this camera and just cry. You know what I mean? So um, that was yesterday and that was 2020 and then 2021 I really tried to start again and it wasn't easy and 2022 now we're back kind of getting on that wagon and now I'm doing vlogmas and it's like lots and lots of content. It's one video every day and it's not for lack of content. The content is there. But are you sure the universe is pushing back and saying, are you sure that this is something that you want to do? That pattern, that cycle is pushing back and saying, are you sure that this is something you want to do? You know, and that is something that I just want us all to remember, that this is a thing that happens in the process of healing, in the process of becoming, in the process of changing. When we say that we want to do certain things, there is going to be pushback. It doesn't just come like on a silver platter. Now, there are moments in life when it does, when it do be like that, oh my God. And it's not like it comes on a silver platter perhaps, but it just flows 
uh, with less resistance than what I've just described. I'm talking about that season when the prayer is answered, when you know the miracle that you were hoping for, when you know the thing that you have been grinding to see come into fruition, and then it takes shape, you know? In that moment, that moment, that moment is supposed to feel like achievement. That moment is supposed to feel, whoo, like for me this year, um, I, I, I built essentially what is my first home. I acquired the property last year, but I only managed to build the first structure on my farm this year and I had a ceremony, you know, oh my god, I remember the first morning after that ceremony, the way it felt in my spirit, I had never felt that before, the accomplishment, the peace, the sense of, oh yeah, I did it, like that's the thing I was working towards, I did it and it was worth it and it was painful and it was scary and everything in this moment it feels worth it and I'm overjoyed I'm with it I'm filled by this thing and that feeling for me First time I ever felt it. <laughs> I swear to God. I mean, from the age of 12, I knew I wanted to be married. By the age, like 10 years later, I was married. Bruh, didn't, didn't feel a thing. I just wanted to get on with like life, to the other stuff, the next chapter, this, that, mm -mm, that was not, that was not my portion. But now I'm sitting, I'm like many years older. Uh, 25 years later, uh, after the first time I realized that, yeah, no, I want marriage for myself as a person. And when I think of the next time I get married, I'm thinking about the big day and I'm thinking about it very differently. I'm thinking about wanting it to be special, um, about leaning into the celebration. And the reason why is because something in me has shifted in being able to rejoice in the answered prayer, being able to live in the answered prayer. That prayer doesn't look the same for all of us. This year for me, it was building on my farm. Maybe for you, it's your graduation or your first job or your first home. But like sometimes that thing, we get the exact thing that we wanted the exact thing that we prayed for in the exact way that we prayed for it but it just doesn't land in here it just doesn't fit doesn't sit and i feel that or i have seen that a lot of the time when we find ourselves in that situation we're trying to remain as the person who prayed for this thing, not understanding that when we were praying for this thing, we were praying to become the person who has it. We weren't praying for that particular achievement. We weren't praying for the graduation or the car or the job. We were praying to become the person who has that qualification, the person who has that uh, vehicle, that home. And when we do not give ourselves 
the permission to become that person, the permission to walk in this world as that person, then we find ourselves trapped in these social contracts that do not acknowledge whom we have become. Not between ourselves and ourselves, and not between ourselves and the people in whom we're in relation to, like in community with. But then we seek understanding. We want those people to understand but we haven't given ourselves that opportunity to understand it of ourselves. Because we're not the same person that we were when we didn't have the thing. And maybe in the process of praying for that thing, we should grieve whom we are. And that's why I think in clearing into consciousness, I speak so much about holding yourself with compassion. Because you have to be compassionate to the version of yourself that you are in this moment. And the version of yourself even that is now in that part of you that you have confined to your shadow self. The version of yourself that is not comfortable in this moment and maybe trying to sabotage the self because that version of yourself is the reason is the one who did the work <laughs> to bring this version of yourself into being so what then how do we release our shadow selves, allow ourselves to become, release the need for the validation from people around us. How do we become? I spoke about this in the very first season or cycle of clearing into consciousness back in the winter solstice of 2020. We acknowledge the divinity of what it is that we are. We acknowledge the divinity of what it is that we accomplish. We acknowledge the divinity of where we are in our journey right now. That's what we do. That's where we start. Because if we do not acknowledge it, then it cannot work. Then we stay self-sabotaging. Even though we do the shadow work, we find new ways to sabotage ourselves. Because the selves that we have become the version of ourselves that have the answer prayer. They want to hold on to that prayer. The reason we don't feel the satisfaction that we sometimes imagine we should feel is we imagine that we just got there by our hard work. We imagine that it's only us who understands what it took. We imagine that it's only us who values this thing. And we don't acknowledge what this means in the broader sense of who we are to our ancestors to our bloodline, the curse that we've broken, the pattern that we've rewritten. If you're the first graduate in your bloodline, I mean, hello. You know, when we're not taking all of that into cognizance, 
then we start to see ourselves performing certain archetypes. And the thing is this, our social contracts and the archetypes that I'm describing, two completely different things. The contracts are in search of belonging. We perform certain behaviors within certain relationships in order to earn our belonging in that relationship. But we all have an inner archetype that is built based on presumptions, social conditioning, fears, an amalgamation of things, of our life experiences, our shadows and our hopes all wrapped into one. And that archetype, it's writing the software for how we perform our participation in our social contracts. You might be trying to break a social contract in which you feel like, you know, when you go home now in December, everybody's just going to be treating you like you're still that girl in grade eight and you're a wife and mother now but you've never done the work of interrogating that social contract and seeing yourself now as a wife and mother and saying you know with your parents i'm a wife and mother now now how do we relate and when we don't do that we're looking for understanding from outside, but we're not giving it to ourselves first. You might go home and act like that child who is only 14 years old. And that might be a performance now of a script that has been written by the archetype that you perform in your answered prayer. What are these archetypes? Okay, I'm going to do a quick rundown because there are four archetypes that I've identified, but I feel like we all fall into maybe like 80 20 principle with these things. So we'll be 80% of one and maybe 5% of the others, right? So the first archetype is this one that we all, 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 all kind of know, who is the runner. Everybody has that one runner in their family. That person who just needs one interview. They, they don't like stay unemployed for long. They just need one interview and they're gonna land the job and then believe you, me, um, maybe they went to another city to do this interview got through all the rounds of interviews and then got the job but just don't show up to the first day of work and then everybody at home is like what and this person's like yeah no nah, not for me they apply for whatever and it always just lands in their laps and they're always just avoiding these opportunities why would that person be doing that? That person typically actually has an understanding of the implications of what it means for them to be in that position. So they know that if I am employed in this way, my family might have these expectations. And what they're doing tends to be running, not from the opportunity, but rather from the, the implement Ooh, it's really. the implications of that. Then we have the squanderer, the person who has the incredible job, but you can't see, can't see a thing, like. They may as well be a cleaner at the company because they have nothing to show for the place that they occupy within that company 
because they squander it some way, somehow, they squander it. And they, they themselves would see, you know, I may be earning 80,000 Rand a month, but I can't for love or money tell you where it all goes because by the fourth day of the month I've got 2,000 Rand and it's got to stretch all the way till the end of the month. That's the life that the squanderer is living. And that person typically is someone who is so afraid of getting things wrong that they almost don't get anything right. They don't want to make decisions. They're living with anxiety. And that reluctance has them running in a different way. So they're not able to enjoy the providence that they have received, and they're not able to do anything fruitful with it. That's not Uptarat. That's patterns of behavior that people have inside of themselves. Yes, there are definitely is Ibopun that do that. Absolutely. But sometimes it's not that. Yes, definitely. It goes, it does, you know, play out these patterns in your financial life, especially Usakola. But it's not always that. And even if it is that, that pattern has not been built into you. And you're going to have to undo the behaviors associated with that pattern and undo the inner scripts that create your archetype that then write the scripts that form your social contracts, whether it's you being more for your friends or you know the person who's always buying groceries at this time of year and then ending up with nothing for yourself, whatever it is. The inner work is going to have to happen. Then the next archetype we have is the squirrel. The squirrel could be earning a million a month. You wouldn't know. <laughs> the squirrel lives as though the prayer has never been answered. They're that person who, just like a squirrel, they keep taking everything that comes in and they dig it away bury it, put it over there, and just carry on as if nothing has changed. And as much as that may benefit future generations, some squirrels are terrible. They will literally hide the cash and like bury the cash or put the cash under their beds or things like that. And you know, the money sometimes rots. We've heard stories like that, you know, or it gets stolen or it gets devalued um, by changing times because it should be in a bag doing something, earning compound interest in an investment or whatever the case might be. But either way, even if the squirrel is putting everything away in trusts and bank accounts and all that wonderful stuff, the thing with providence is that it is supposed to plant a seed of prosperity in your life. It's supposed to be the thing that brings that plenty in which you're now able to prosper, right? So when you're living like nothing's changed, what's the point? You could be getting the best health care in the world, but you don't because you're living like nothing's changed. You could be eating a diet that's perfectly suited to your blood type to prevent possible genetic disorders that run in your family, but you don't because you don't want to spend the extra on a dietitian, but you can literally afford it. So if you're taking time off the end of your life to save money today, 
what is even the point? You're not giving yourself the quality of life that will give you a better quality of life when you're older. Then what is the point? How are you prospering in that providence? Then the final, final archetype that I have seen in these patterns of how we live in the arts of prayer is the ogre. And now I call this person the ogre because because <laughs> everybody says, yo, that person changed, right? They used to be like this and they're not anymore. And the thing with this person is that they will move in this manner of openness and generosity and presume that we're all on the same page, right? Um, and then when they start to see that, wait a minute, we're not on the same page, they now start setting these boundaries. Maybe like the squirrel has, that like, listen, this principal amount goes in to a trust and we live off the interest. Or, and then people are like, yo, but it was good times. <laughs> What's changed? You know, but this person is just seeing that in order for us to have the longevity of this providence, we cannot just continue like this. I thought that we were all, you know, understanding that maybe we use the butter only for hot toast and we fry using the sunflower oil. But there's people in this house who are scooping out spoonfuls of Kerrygold butter or Lurpak butter to fry an egg. And then when you want a piece of toast with butter, there's no butter. And it's like the first week of the month. And that was your little splurge purchase. And then you turn around and you're like, I guys. Now about to... And it's like, yo, bruh, but like, I thought we were all on the same page. No, we're not all on the same page because the boundary wasn't set at the beginning. You didn't say, hey, butter is for toast, margarine is for mashed potatoes, and olive oil is for salads, sunflower oil is for frying things. You didn't say that. You thought that everybody would think that because that's what you think. And then when you now start saying, A, 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 everybody around you is experiencing you as an ogre because you're retroactively setting boundaries. But essentially, all of these archetypes are all trying to preserve a sense of self, literally trying to survive living in the arts of prayer. And we've all got a prayer that's been answered. The ones that we prayed out loud and the ones that we whispered. And the thing is, when you see these things inside yourself and you ask yourself, how can I preserve my relationships? but break the social contracts. Maybe when not umurik, you're the one that's squandering all your money because your friends expect you to be the one who buys the, the booze at the party and you're like, I really love these people, but the social contract that we have now established between us is something that I wanna break. How do I do it? Or it's with your family. Your family is expecting you to pay for everything, but you're not the only person who's employed. How do you break that social contract without losing the relationship? It's not that simple. It's not as simple as even I would like it to be. Because it involves doing more work. <laughs> It involves understanding how you came into those places to begin with. 
It involves acknowledging that the prayer has been answered. And then it involves building that relationship with your ancestors, wherein they are the ones who explain to you why it is that they brought this providence into your life and how it is that they would like for you to distribute it, to share it amongst those who you live amongst, the community, the family, the friendship group, whatever it may be, the self. You know, I've seen so many people in the last few years who say, it's so good right now, I just don't want to mess it up. I just don't want to mess it up. And that's what prospering in Providence is for. It's for doing that work. Because, whew, nothing on earth could have prepared me for what it is to live in the answered prayer. And to still honor that self that prayed for this moment. And to not hate the self that I don't yet know that has all these things. What? <laughs> There's a stranger in my house, in my life, and it is me. Because I've never seen this version of me before. Because this version of me has never existed before. And now I have to build a whole new relationship with them. And that's where answers from our ancestors comes in. And it, it's just, I cannot believe that course because it's literally the free course. And the way those guided journaling prompts rock me, like, But sometimes we need to remember why we started. Sometimes we need to take it back to the top so that we can understand why the moment that we're in is as important as it is. So that we have the context through which to acknowledge the moment that we're in when this prayer is answered. So there's that. It can go either way. <laughs> can go either way. The tools are there. Whether you're signing up to answers from our ancestors and trying to remember why you started, or whether you go and sign up to Prospering in Providence, mm -hmm to learn to love living in the answered prayer. We're just here to get those resources. And I hope, I hope that this round of clearing into consciousness was as clarifying for you as it was for me, even though it didn't feel nice. It was certainly, as always, deeply effective. Take advantage of the offerings that we have right now. I am so excited for the ways in which I'm being called to work. And also just for the fact that I'm doing it. Because none of this is new. So much of what I'm putting up now is years old. It's years and years old. It's just, I guess I didn't acknowledge the divinity of what it was before now. And now that I see it, well, what else can I do? 
That's my answer prayer. I have to show up there. I hope that you do the same for yours.